Hi, we're going to go ahead and get started, I think. Other folks might join as time goes on. Um, we'll see how that goes. So I'm Sarah Lewis. I'm with the Cooperative Extension. In a few seconds, I'm going to go ahead and put up the presentation, and I'll probably toggle between presentation and me, <laughs> um, depending. And so if you have the handouts there, then I don't have to worry quite so much about whether you've seen everything on each slide, because maybe you'll have, if you have the hard copy in front of you. Um, so we'll give that a try. So it looks like right now all we have is some folks from Haynes. A shout out to Haynes. <laughs> um, and there is another library on the screen, but I don't see any people in the picture. So I would actually like if Haynes, if you could unmute yourself for a second and just say hi, and then on my screen you'll be big and you won't just be just these little people down in the corner. Hello. Hi. Did it work? That didn't work. Oh, yes, it worked. Yay, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Now Delay. you can mute yourself so you can chat amongst yourself as much as you like. <laughs> Thank you. Now you're bigger. And then the other little empty room can just be down in the corner. So this is actually my first time doing an OWL presentation, so I apologize if I have to talk with the video conferencing folks and ask them to do anything, or I've got some very kind folks back here who can help me as well. But I'm just going to go ahead and get going. So like I said, I'm Sarah Lewis. I'm with the Cooperative Extension, which is, um, so I'm not looking in the right place. There's the camera. So. Um, the Cooperative Extension is a program from the University of Alaska Fairbanks, which is the Alaska Land Grant College. I don't know if you're familiar with Cooperative Extension, but we are, you can think of us as the community education arm of the University of Alaska Fairbanks. We both bring, educate, bring um, research and, and evidence-based programs to the public, but we also get information back from the public so that the university and all of the universities throughout the country know that the things that they're doing are relevant to, to people who are just out in the public. So one of the things that we've heard a lot about, of course, um, I'm in the Health, Home, and Family Development Program. You, Some people are more familiar with the agriculture and horticulture programs and the 4-H programs with Cooperative Extension, like Master Gardeners and, like I said, 4-H and all of their youth programs. The Health, Home, and Family Development Program in Alaska is focused on, in, in my office, we say that our agriculture, horticulture, 4-H is outside and the Health, Home, and Family Development is inside, but not necessarily always the case. So what I'm going to talk about today is paying off debt. I am going to go ahead and start the presentation. So I think I disappear at that point. We'll find out what happens. <laughs> Present. Yay, OK. So, uh, good, thumbs up that you see the presentation. Thanks so much for that. <laughs> so, uh, paying off debt, the valiant fight against the forces of necessary evil. That's kind of how I consider it. So, um, we've got to keep a little bit of levity about debt because it is a pretty big issue in a lot of our lives, but we do need to focus on it a bit. And um, where do I, the arrows. Like these? No, OK. So again, myself, Sarah Lewis with the Cooperative Extension. There will be another slide like this at the end of the session as well. But you also have the hard copy there if you need information about how to contact me. I'm here in Juneau, so in southeast with y'all in Haines. And I have at the bottom there a note about sort of one of my focus areas in the Health, Home, and Family Development Program, we can develop different focus areas, any, anything from related to children, to finances, to food preservation. Here in Southeast, I focus on uh, family resilience, 
So that can include anything from food safety and security, which includes pre food preservation, home finances, home energy, and family emergency preparedness. So that's part of the reason that I developed this particular program, because it does address a pretty significant family resilience area, which is finances. I'm going to go ahead and stop for a minute, because I do, I think, maybe notice that we have other folks coming online. And so I'd like to, so I'm going to stop the presentation for a second and see who we've got. So um, the folks, Seward, Seward is there. If you wouldn't mind just saying hi, to make sure that you can be heard and everything if you need hi. to be. Hi, this is Rachel at the Seward Library. Hi, I'm Welcome. Ryan. Thank you. Sorry, I and dropped And so my... you can go ahead and mute now if you don't mind, just because it keeps the screen from popping around. So we've got Seward and Haynes on the line. I was just introducing myself. I'll go ahead and go back to the presentation. There was another location on the screen for a minute, and maybe they're trying to connect, so they might come back, and so we'll, we'll figure out who they are when they come back. It takes a bit for the presentation to get on the screen. Okay. All right. So we're back. So just introducing myself, I can give you more of this information later. Um, and it's also if you have the hard copy there in Seward. If you could give a thumbs up if you have the hard copy. No, you don't. Um, I, oh, I'm not sure that actually Seward was on my list when I sent them out earlier today. So I apologize for that. I'll send it later. I sent a hard copy just in case the on-screen one didn't work. So if you have any problems reading the presentation on screen, then I can get you a copy pretty quickly after the presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and continue with the presentation. So household debt, that's the topic for today. This are, these are the three main things I'm going to cover. I'm going to cover good, good and bad debt. You've probably heard those discussed in the past, the differences between good and bad debt. Then I'm going to discuss seven steps for paying off and staying out of debt. And I will actually go through those seven steps. And then the final, and that's actually the biggest part of this, because that is the goal of this presentation, is to help you have tools to help you figure out how to pay off and stay out of debt. But then the final thing that I'm going to cover is the value of a good credit score. So the first topic, debt, good or bad. So bad debt you will often hear of as, as being credit cards, consumer debt. Uh, I like to think of them as things that you purchase that, that depreciate in value, that don't keep their value for whatever reason. Shoes don't tend to keep their value, unfortunately. Maybe some do. Um, but this isn't necessarily a hard and fast rule. For example, when you look, look down there at good debt, I tend myself not to call anything good debt, but there is debt that I consider not necessarily bad. It's, it can be, no matter, no matter what kind of debt it is, it does weigh on you to a certain extent. But some of that debt, if it's incurred to increase your net worth, can be a good investment over the long term. Student loans tend to be a good, good example of this, and mortgage loans tend also to be a good um, example of this. But not always necessarily. Auto loans, for example, are often in the bad debt category. But if you need an auto for your livelihood, then that may be something that you need to incur. Mortgage loans, sometimes those can start to be bad debt, depending on what's going on with the market. So that's something that you want to be aware of when you are entering into a mortgage loan. Same with student loans. Though we tend to think of those as good debt, and a lot of times they are, but you do need to think about when you're going into student debt whether or not there's going to be what kind of return on investment. Sometimes it's hard if you're look, you know, if you're 18 years old or you're helping your 18 year old trying to figure out what kind of education they're going to get. It's hard to necessarily think of that um, in terms of what kind of job they're going to get at the end. But if you're older, for example, and you're going back to school, 
those types of things might be something that you could think a little bit more about whether or not you're going to be able to pay off that debt at the end, depending on how expensive the school was. So a lot of the good and bad debt decisions will be up to you and your situation. But in general, if it depreciates in value, it's not good debt, it's bad debt. If it does help the your, your net worth, then it may be a, a, a debt that it's okay to get into. So. So these are the steps. I'm gonna go into each one of these in more detail in the coming slides. I'm gonna look at the time to make sure where I am. Um, but I'll go ahead, I've listed them out here in one place. So um, if you have or when you have the hard copy, it's something that you can look at to kind of see what steps I'm, I'm heading towards. Listing your debts, finding debt payment funds, that sounds so easy, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Making a schedule, following the schedule, reducing or eliminating debt opportunities, assessing your savings accounts and strengthening them, and then making a schedule to pay off good debt, because that's kind of one of the orders that people think about is trying to pay off your so-called bad debts first, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. I always put the little note at the bottom to forgive your mistakes and get back to it. You're working on these steps, as long as you're moving, mostly moving forward, every once in a while, your go, things may go awry, your schedule goes off, you increase your debt for a little while, things like that. The main thing is to stay conscious of it and forgive yourself and move on. So step one, listing your debts. Gather the most recent statements from every loan account, and then from those statements, you want to know the creditor, who it is that you have the debt with, the balance that you owe, the interest rate you're paying, and your current minimum monthly payment. This is step one, just gathering information. For credit card minimum payments, select what you consider to be your average payment. Hopefully it's not the minimum payment that they often tell, that you, tell you that you can pay, but select what you consider to be the average payment and consider doubling it in terms of when you're just making this list to, and, and, and then as we go into the next steps, you can see how you can use that, those numbers. This is one of the more time consuming, but pretty clearly one of the most important parts of figuring out how you're going to pay your debt. First, create a monthly spending plan. I don't say budget because sometimes that can seem like it gets very, um, it can be a, a complicated process, creating a budget and sticking to a budget. Instead, coming up with two categories, necessary expenses and unnecessary expenses. Necessary expenses, and I do include debts in that, the minimum or whatever you had put down on your list in step one, those are included in the necessary monthly expenses. So making a list of those, mortgage, child care, um, electricity, you should even put what your standard grocery, you know, your food, obviously, those are, that's a necessary monthly expense. That can sometimes be a variable amount, but do try to come up with an amount for that. Then you list your unnecessary monthly expenses. One of the best ways that I've found to do this is, and I'm, I'm not endorsing a, a product or anything because there are other things out there, but mint.com is actually a good free online service where you can um, you can set up your bank accounts. It will actually download what you've been spending. You can put it into categories. I actually, when I use Mint, I literally have necessary and unnecessary to make it pretty simple for myself. There are other programs like um, QuickBooks and Quicken. Those are another way that you can do it if those are something you're familiar with. But it's important to know, to have it in front of you, what your necessary monthly expenses are and what your unnecessary monthly expenses are. Then, when you're looking at debt, if in the necessary monthly expenses, you actually, if you're doing your necessary monthly expenses and you weren't to include your debts, and then you have your unnecessary monthly expenses, if you don't have enough money left over to actually pay off your debts, that's another 
that's kind of another process. That's when you need to start talking to your creditors and negotiating with them about reducing your monthly payments, coming up with a payment plan. A lot of times this is hard to do with credit cards and national companies, but if, for example, you have payments that you owe to a local doctor, they may be willing to work with you to reduce your monthly uh, debt expenditure with them as long as you have an agreement about when you will have it paid off. So that's unfortunate, that's, that's not something that I'm going into in depth here. I'm kind of making a bit of an assumption on this one that you are going to have some funds left over after you've made a list of all your necessary expenses and your debt payments. Then what you do is you look at those unnecessary expenses and you figure out where you can, where you can grab some. Another thing you can do is try to increase your income. I know that sounds, that sounds very difficult, but it, it sometimes can be very helpful instead of looking at the lattes that you can decrease over the month. Maybe it would be better time spent if you can negotiate or if it's time for you to be negotiating a raise, then consider doing that. Consider preparing to actually propose that to your employer. Or if you have a side business that you've been thinking about doing, maybe you can look at trying to do that. Looking at increasing your income in, in creative ways. Also another way that you can increase the funds you have that you can pay off debts with is to negotiate on some of those necessary monthly expenses depending on what kind of assets you have. You can refinance a mortgage to reduce the monthly payment. You can ne negotiate with, like I was talking about in terms of trying to decrease your monthly debts, but you can actually negotiate with various, um, like you can negotiate or, or change what you're doing like with your cable company or your phone company. You can, you can, inc you can decrease some of those expenses and find extra money that you can put towards your debt. Another thing that to always consider is we get a couple of shots in the army each year. We get the permanent fund dividend. That's something that's really good to just earmark it as paying off debt. Uh, another one is uh, if you get a tax return, that's another one that it's really good to automatically earmark that to pay off debt. Those tend to be two things here in Alaska that people may get. So. It's kind of a complicated process, but this is actually one of the most important parts. It's to sit down when you have all of your information in front of you, list your necessary expenses, list your unnecessary expenses, and find the money to help pay more money towards your debts. So this is when, when you're looking at your, the, the so-called bad debt, things that you want to get off your list. So you, that list that you created of your debts, those that are not increasing your life's value in some way or your, um, uh, your, your general value, what you do is you stop, stop getting new ones, stop adding to the list of bad debts. So that means stop using your credit card for a little while or things like that. And then I actually have, unfortunately in Seward, you're not gonna have the handout, but I um, have a handout of an online resource that is really quite good. And you can write this down if you, and you can actually see it right there. It's the vertex42.com. That's a debt reduction calculator. It's a really great, I don't have any slides of it unfortunately, but it's a really great online tool. It's, um, uh, I think it's Excel based, but they may have a couple different versions. So you can download it onto your own computer so you're not putting your information you know, out there on the web or anything. You download it to your own computer. And I don't know if you're going to be able to see this. But basically, let's see, in, um, I think in Haynes, you will probably have copies of this there. So what it does is it gives you an opportunity to list all of those debts that you have in a spreadsheet, list the balances, list the rates, list how much payments you're making at this time. And you can do a few things. It actually gives you directions on um, different strategies for paying off debt. There's two things that, that people, there's the avalanche or the snowball. With the snowball, you're paying the lowest balances first. 
And with the avalanche, you're paying the things with the highest interest first. So if you're paying the lowest balance first, it kind of gives you the, 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 uh, the benefit of the snowball effect in that it seems like it's getting, you're paying off more and more. But you may actually ending up, you may end up paying more interest in the end. If you do the avalanche one where you pay the highest interest first, in the end, when you've paid off all your debts, you will have paid less, but it doesn't feel as motivational in the beginning. And sometimes having that early motivation that the snowball version gives you is a really beneficial thing because it kind of keeps you going. But what's great about the debt calculator is it helps you see, it actually calculates out for you what your payments would be and when you would have them paid off. So you can actually see it in a pretty clear spreadsheet. And then you can move it around to decide what you'd like to pay off first. Uh, you can change your payment amounts for certain things and it'll actually recalculate it and you'll see when you'll have certain things paid off. So that's a pretty good thing to do for consumer debt. That's not as good for larger debts like student loans or mortgages. I believe they actually do have calculators on there that will deal with some of those larger debts. But another way you can, um, I'm gonna get to mine, get to the same place. So uh, another way that you can do the larger debts, I'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation in terms of figuring out how you'd like to pay them off quicker. So, and then they also have something called snowflakes, which is exactly what our permanent fund dividend and tax returns are. It's putting one big chunk in there all at once and you can see what that would do, how many years earlier that might help you pay off your debt. So those are, it's actually a really good tool to look at and it helps you see it more as a big picture. So step four, to help keep on track after you've figured out with your debt calculator what debts you'd like to pay off first, how much you want to pay towards them, it's really a good idea to do whatever you can to automate it so that you're not having to try to motivate yourself each month, but it's something that is automatically either taken out of your bank account. Um, there's, there's different services. I have four or three listed here, and there may be others that people use depending on if they have special programs at their work, for example. But a bill pay service with your bank, that's setting up online payments directly from your bank to certain uh, creditors or anything, it could be even being your, um, your necessary payments for each month. If you set those up as well, then you know that those are going to be covered each month and then you can be clearer about what, how much money you have for other payments. So setting up a bill pay service through your bank. Another one is automatic withdrawals from your bank. Some credit cards, for example, um, you can actually set up an electronic check payment and they go to your bank and pull money. You've authorized them to pull money from your bank as opposed to your bank sending a check out. So automatic withdrawals from a bank is, an, is another service that I've mostly seen credit cards having that, that system. Automatic transfers are another one. If you're having to transfer from, for example, you have the same bank for your checking and your mortgage. Automatic transfers to the mortgage are a really good idea. Before all of this, you also need to consider automatic deposits. So anything that you can do to set up automatic deposits from your employer, uh, or if you are getting any kind of uh, checks from the government or another organization, a lot of those nowadays, they're actually requiring that they be automatically deposited into your bank, which is great. And so if you're able to set up with those organizations, your work or something else that deposits into your account exactly the days when they're going to do that, you will know when you have enough money to be able to schedule the rest of your payments, the rest of your automated bill payment. So automating, 
your income into the accounts that you're going to pay debts from and then automating those payments out. There's actually an added benefit to this and this is something that I talk about a lot in I do a, a family emergency preparedness class and I talk about automating a lot in that because it actually has the added benefit that if there if you do have some sort of emergency either I mean it can be anything from a natural you know a natural disaster or you lose your job or you have an illness if everything's automated you're much less likely to miss payments because of whatever the, the emergency may have been missed payments nowadays can cost you a lot of money unfortunately either with interest or with um, fees that are charged so automating actually can help reduce those fees and if you're in some sort of situation where it might be hard for you for a couple of months to remember to pay then having it automated is actually a really nice thing you do of course need to every couple of months check it all out or you know be checking your statements and things to make sure everything remains automated because sometimes things you know break down a credit card number changes or something like that and so you do need to check every once, check it every once in a while, but it's a good thing to do, automating things. So then after, you, after you've done that, reducing or, and or eliminating debt opportunities. So my first one there is get out the scissors because cutting up credit cards is often a very good thing to do. Uh, that's that's one of the one of the first methods that another one another one that that I've heard people do and I've actually done it myself before when I was in college once is you put your credit card into a bag of water and you freeze it in the refrigerator so that you can't use it until it has thawed out so it's one of those things just like the 24 hour rule there which is giving yourself time to make sure that what you're thinking about purchasing is something that you really need it's giving you a little bit of time not to make impulse purchases. Reducing to two to three credit card accounts maximum is a very, very good idea. It's good for your credit score, which I'll talk about later. It, um, and it also just reduces, these credit cards nowadays will increase your credit limit to crazy amounts, and that can affect your, your um, credit score if, if some, for some people, if it's not coming back saying it's not accepted, they keep using the credit card. So reducing the number of credit cards is a, is a good thing to do. One thing that some people do is they return to cash. They set themselves for their, if they have a certain amount of unnecessary expenses that aren't automated, they require that those have to all be done in cash because with cash, when you're handing over money, you're much more conscious about what you're spending. Financial fast is something that I've heard of people doing. I've actually done it myself a couple times, where you just are very rigid with yourself for a period of time, uh, a couple of weeks, a month, two months, that you are only, only buying what is necessary. And what you can do with that is it, it just gives you a period of time when you are strengthening your finances by making sure that you're not buying anything that's unnecessary for a period of time. Uh, one that sometimes tends to get people is shopping online. It's very easy to shop online. It's actually much easier to shop online and spend way too much money and then have uh, you know, shipping costs as well. So reducing the amount of time you spend shopping online will help. Another one that someone brought up recently was if you're tempted to spend, if you have, if you feel like you have an issue with spending because it feels good, try to do something else that feels good. Call a friend, go on a walk, I crochet, so that's why I put that in there. Do something else for a period of time because sometimes there is, there is a, a jolt of good feeling that people get by, from giving themselves a gift. And so making sure that you look at all of these possibilities of postponing when you purchase something, reducing the number of credit cards you have, et cetera, and then maybe doing something that will help you forget about what you might have wanted to purchase. All right, so the next step 
once you feel like you have your bad debts under control, and that means you've got a regular payment plan with them, you're paying extra towards them, you've looked at your um, debt payment schedule, and it's looking pretty good, and you know when you're going to be able to get those paid off, or you've figured out that you're going to be able to get them paid off. I don't actually, and a lot of people don't actually say, then go towards those good debts. Start paying down your mortgage. Start paying down your student loans. You obviously need to pay what you need to, you know, the minimum payment on those each month. Usually the, that's a relatively high amount already, and you need to pay it. But you don't necessarily automatically go towards paying off those good debts. A really good idea is to look at your savings accounts and the other things that can be affected if you have some sort of emergency, whether it's a financial emergency, um, a family emergency, your, you have a, a home fire, things like that, your emergency savings, your operational savings, some sort of long-term savings, and then making sure that your insurance and your retirement and investment accounts are looking pretty good. Before paying off those good debts, which are actually giving you value, look at the things that will keep you from getting back into bad debt. So, for example, having an emergency savings of even uh, one month, and then you suddenly have to have a, a, you know, a car repair. If you don't have your car, you can't get to work. You have to repair your car. I once heard that if you can afford it, it's not an emergency. Emergency savings can allow you to, and, and extra operational savings, having a good solid savings account can help you afford what would otherwise be an emergency so you don't end up getting just back into bad debt. So looking at those before you head to addressing your good debts. Then seven, that's when you start, when you feel like you've got your, your payment schedule for your bad debts set up. You know that you're going to be able to reach your goal or you've already reached it. You look at your savings and then you start looking at the payment of good debt. And there are, in, for that, instead of using the debt payment calculator that I showed you earlier at, Vort at Vertex 42, what you can do is you can go, most ba banking online sites, they will have calculators, they'll have loan calculators you can kind of play with those big mortgage type loans on one of their loan calculators and see what would happen if you increased the amount you paid, how long it would take to pay it off, or you can see if you can if you can negotiate different interest rates. You can you can play with that a little bit on those bank uh, loan calculators. And then you can see about it's it really is amazing when you start paying down the principal on a mortgage, for example, even small amounts can take years, which is, of course, years of interest rate off of the loan. And so it is really, really good to look at that. Again, the Vertex42.com has, has lots of different calculators on it that you can use for different financial situations that you might be in. Now, so after going through all of those steps, um, or actually while you're going through all of those steps, something to always to consider is your credit score. We often hear about free credit reports and such, and you can get free credit reports. Um, I think I have, do I have, I don't think I have it listed there. Um, you can go to www.annualcreditreport.com and that you, you can get, you're allowed to get, I believe it's one or two free credit reports a year. I think it's just one from each of three agencies. It, it's a little bit complicated, but once you, if you go online to that site, it's not that complicated. You can get an annual credit report for free. What you can't get for free is your credit score. And what's important about your credit score is that if you do have an emergency, or maybe it's not an emergency, and you're ready to either buy a car or, or get a mortgage on your home, if you had a good credit score, it can save you thousands of dollars because you will get more optimal, you'll get optimal loan rates. They might reduce the interest rate you pay. 
um, things like that that will actually be, or they might reduce the fees that you have to pay up front. There are different things that if you have a good credit score, you can save money over the term of those larger loans. Or if you have to get um, consumer loans, a lot of times having a good credit score will help you get those. So credit scores, the higher the better. Basically, anything under 600 and, and you're going to have some difficulty. 500 especially and below, you'll have difficulty. You'll be charged more for loans, basically, because they will consider you to be something of a financial risk. The higher you go, and about, I think I read 70% 70, 70 or maybe it's 60% of Americans are above 700, which is, which is a decent credit score. But if you get up into the high 700s, then you can get really great interest rates and things like that. So it is good to get your credit score. You will have to pay for it. And when you go to get your free annual credit report, they will try to sell you all, they will attempt to sell it to you. One of the things you need to be careful of when you are getting your credit score is if someone is giving you your credit score for free, you're not getting it for free. They're going to probably give you some, you're going to be signed up for something that if you don't cancel it within a couple of months, you're going to be charged. So it's actually really a good idea to pay the 10 or $15 for your credit score rather than trying to get a free one because you will probably end up paying money later on that you didn't expect to pay. So it's better to go ahead and just get the 10 or $15 credit score. So that's a plug for credit scores. And that's one of the reasons why you want to have a minimal number of credit cards because the more credit cards you have, the more different places you apply for credit that will actually go, that will affect negatively, that will negatively affect your credit score. So if you're going through a period of time, for example, when you are sort of shopping around for a loan, it's a really good idea to do that in a short period of time, or if you're shopping around for different credit cards, for example, do it in as short a period of time as possible, less than two weeks, because in any two week period, they could kind of consider all of that um, FICO, which is the organization that compiles the credit scores, the credit information. If you're shopping around for a credit score, try to do it in a short period of time. If you do it over a lengthy period of time, each time you do it, it'll ding your credit score. So if you're shopping around for a loan or a new credit card, do it in a short period of time. So that is, that's the bulk of the presentation. Um, I, it, it goes a lot quicker on, <laughs> I'm discovering it goes a lot quicker on OWL than it does in person, maybe because when I'm doing it in person with, with people, people ask questions. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do now is see if I'm gonna turn off the presentation and I'm gonna see if there are any questions. And what you can do is, uh, just so that we're kind of doing one site at a time between Seward and Haynes, if you have a question, just go ahead and raise your hand and I will call on your city and then you can unmute so that we don't have dueling um, microphones. So does anybody have any questions? Oh, I'm actually, oh, hi. <laughs> hi. I'm, I'm a staff member here, but I'm actually attending as oh, a, great. Thank a, you. an attendee. And I have um, a question about the savings versus debt. I keep meaning to have, I, I don't have savings except for retirement savings. And every time I get my credit cards down, I keep saying, I'll just pay on my credit cards and then and then I'll start saving. And then some emergency happens, medical, head gasket on the car, veterinary, and you know, then I charge it. And I can't seem to get out of that pattern. It's been happening now for four years ever since I bought a house. And right. And, I, and then I, I can't seem to make myself put money into savings because I'm thinking, you know, otherwise I'm paying interest on the card, on the credit card. So it seems better to pay that off rather than put it into savings. But then the cycle continues and emergency happens. And yeah. I don't know if I should just make myself put a little bit into savings. I don't know. You know, one, one thing that we are in that kind of situation where it seems like you probably have a, a pretty good system for paying down your debts just when you get really, really close. It goes back up. Like so yeah. that snowflake thing, where if you get little windfalls, like the PFD, put those into savings. 
Oh, you see, so those to pay off debt. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, you know, really, it, it is. Yeah. It's a good idea to pay off debt. <laughs> I mean, and so that's when using the debt calculator is actually a really good idea because then you can actually start to analyze your debt in real terms. Which ones have high interest rates? Which ones have low interest rates? Credit cards tend to have high interest rates. They tend to be the ones with higher interest rates, especially if there's been a period of time when you haven't paid it off in a timely manner, they increase the interest rate, stuff like that. You know, it is actually better to pay off the credit card debt. So then it becomes that whole thing of not getting into debt again, and that just ends up being a timing thing. So that unfortunately, I don't have I don't have a silver bullet answer for you because that that's actually a situation that a lot of people are in. One of the good things is that at least if you're if you are being diligent about, diligent about paying off your debt, if there is a period of time when there isn't another yeah. reason to go into debt, then you've got the mentality that you're down and then you can actually have those few months of peace, hopefully, where you can put things into savings rather than... And I just keep wondering if I put it in savings, I might actually make myself... I mean, I'm pretty frugal, but I could be yeah. more frugal. You know, I could cancel yeah. the case. And I, yeah, know, I don't know. I, yeah, that's but, mm -hmm. but that's always hard. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that that is where that's one of the first things you need to do is just get a big picture of your finances, yeah. the necessary and the unnecessary, and then you need to make the value judgments for yourself, for your own finances, about what to do about that. Um, I think the main thing is that if you're staying conscious about it. And you are, you're not just paying the minimums on your credit cards, for example. You are paying larger amounts on your credit cards. Then it just ends up being kind of a timing thing, like you're talking about. And hopefully there will be a period of time when you paid your credit cards down to a certain amount. Maybe even if it's just down to a certain amount. And then it all doesn't run into a court. And then <laughs> Yes, yes, and so, and I mean, another thing to consider on that, not necessarily for pets, so they do, of course, have pet insurance, but having insurance, like it, it, making sure that you've got adequate health insurance, making sure that you've got adequate home insurance, so if, like, the boiler goes out, that you've got insurance that can help you pay for that kind of thing, that helps you not have to go into credit card debt. A lot of people, something like that will happen, and they won't even go to their insurance company and find out whether their insurance policy will pay for an amount of that, and they just put it all into debt, rather than finding out that actually they have a policy that they've been paying for that could help pay for an emergency situation. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah that actually makes me wonder about something. Yeah. <laughs> so knowing what your insurance policies will cover and making sure that they're up to date is, is another way that you can make sure that you're not using credit debt to pay for things that you're actually paying for insurance to cover if it happens. So, so assessing that kind of stuff. So then, yeah, so then just doing the necessary and the unnecessary and paying close attention to the unnecessary and, um, and seeing what you can do about increasing your savings. And if you, get, if you get your credit card debt down to something that feels reasonable to you and you're not paying a large amount of um, interest rates and things like that, get down to a couple hundred dollars, whatever your threshold is. And for some people, keeping it, actually keeping their credit card debt at a certain amount keeps them from getting more. Some people have like this threshold where they feel like that's that's too much debt. Mm -hmm. But it's small enough that it kind of keeps them from using their card again because they want to keep paying it down. And if you get your credit cards to that amount, then maybe you do still go start looking at your savings accounts at that point. And yes, financially, you're not going to be making as much from your savings accounts, which are only going to be giving you like what, 0, 0.0 something in interest, as you will be paying out towards your debt. But it's so, you could have a psychological thing where you are sort of taking care of both at the same time, if that makes sense. And that's just something that each person needs to Assess. Okay, I see a hand. I see a couple hands in Haynes. Go ahead and unmute. Hi, this is Diane in Haynes. Um, basically, we do have some questions here. Yes. Excellent. Uh, 
Uh, first of all, just a couple comments. One, I love that idea of freezing the credit card in a bag of water. Love it. Um, because I only have one credit card. And the uh, I have to have that to travel. You cannot travel in this country any longer without a credit card. Nope. Okay, so there it is. That's the reality of my life. Now, here's my question. Is it ever a good idea to go into good debt if you don't have debt, that kind of debt? If you only have bad debt, should you ever go into good debt? Is it ever a good idea? That's a good question, and that's, you know, and I don't think that there's necessarily a blanket response to that, answer to that, because it really does depend on how much benefit you're going to get from that good debt. Um, I'm not going to call it good debt. The less bad debt. <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if you were there, if you were here in the beginning of of the presentation, but yeah, so basically it's bad debt and not quite so bad debt. And you need to assess that for your circumstances. For example, if you're looking at changing careers and you need to go back to school for that, and you know that the career that you're changing to would be something that makes you more money, that gives you more peace of mind, that gives you financial security, and is something that you're going to want to do, Going into debt to do that, which you often have to do to get an education nowadays, that's another thing that you pretty much, you almost always have to go into debt to do, that might not be a bad idea, even if you do have some bad debt to deal with. Uh, the main thing is recognizing, and then uh, what you might want to do is checking out your credit score and your credit report find out what it says about you because when you do go for those loans for either a mortgage or student loans you'll have an idea whether the amount of, of bad debt you have is affecting your credit score so if you have either enough different types of credit cards which you don't but if you have enough different types of bad debt out there in the records uh, or you have of the credit that's out there for you, you're using a whole bunch of it. Like if your your credit card has a ten thousand dollar limit and you're up at you know nine thousand nine hundred dollars, that's going to affect your credit score. Before you go for that student loan or that mortgage, you are likely going to want to at least look at getting that bad debt to a point where it is not affecting your credit score because that will, that may affect the, your ability to get the loan that you're looking at, mortgage or otherwise, or it might affect the interest rate that you're going to pay on that particular loan. So that's something that you would just want to look at. Thank you so much. We have even more questions from Haynes. Hooray. I have a quick question about if you're on a cash basis and you're out of debt, what maintains your credit score? That, I'm glad that you asked that because that's actually a good follow-on to one of the things um, that Diane said, which was that she has one credit card and that that's necessary for travel. Frankly, having one or two credit cards is actually necessary for you to keep a credit score. To even try to get a good credit score, you actually have to have some sort of credit record, unfortunately. And so if you're working on a cash basis, one thing that is actually, it's, I always hate, it feels so wrong for me to say this, but it actually is important to have at least one credit card that has one automatic payment on it that you pay regularly, that you have automated. It helps keep your credit score good in case you do need to get, like I was talking about, one of those bigger loans for either an emergency reason or for non-emergency. You want need to buy a home or some other thing that you need to get a loan for. So even if you're on a cash basis, which is fabulous, it is actually a good idea nowadays to have a credit card, but absolutely make sure that you're paying it off each month and that you do have some things on it but you're paying it off each month. Does and that that's answer what your we'll questions? 
that's what will mean the only thing that will maintain your credit score uh, you know that's not the only thing if you have other loans if you have a mortgage um, if you have student loans any type of credit you that don't you have, have any. there what's that? what's that say you don't have anything like that um, you know what I would do if you're in that situation right now I would go ahead and find out what your credit report and your credit score is okay and if it's good then whatever you've done in your life is a two thumbs up if you've had credit in the past sometimes even things like um, whether you've had um, like um, uh, parking tickets and things in the past those will can actually come up on your credit score or if you've had a landlord that reported you at some point years ago those can come up on your credit report and can affect your credit score so I, I basically, unfortunately, I basically have to say that if you don't have a credit record, I'm not actually sure how your credit score is going to look. You should find out what it is and then assess your situation from there. If your credit score is bad because you don't have a credit record, I know this sounds really, it's just totally counterintuitive, but if, it's, if your credit score is bad, it may be because you don't have enough of a credit record for them to give you a good score. Thank you. Sure. Uh, this, this is Diane again. I just have a quick, is there ever a time in one's life where you don't care what your credit score is? Now that's an excellent question <laughs> because I think we would all like to get to that point. Um, I would imagine that there is. If you if your income is stable, you if down. you are on a cash basis, your my only concern is when it comes to emergency preparedness, because emergencies can come in all types, um, and they may be emergencies where you you need it will be very helpful to you to have a, it will save you money to have a good credit score. Of course, if you don't have a great credit score, you can probably still get those funds. It's just that it'll end up costing you more over the life of the loan. I don't unless it's a terrible credit score, like under 500, and people just won't loan to you at all. That would be a problem. So you'd still, no matter what's going on in your finances, if you've got a terrible credit score for whatever reason, you should probably do something to bring it up. Okay, uh, this is Diane again. I just want to make the comment that um, I don't know how other people, uh, what their relationships with their families are. But in my family, so one of us, and it's a pretty good extended original family, one of us uh, had the gall to make a substantial amount of money. And so we think of him as the family bank. And so, you know, if I were to have some kind of an emergency, I would never go to a bank bank. I would go to my family bank. And I don't see that figured in anywhere in your presentation. And yet, I think a lot of people do that. That's you know, that's, that's actually one of the things that I discuss in my family emergency preparedness class which is connections with others and actually be a really, really great way to be prepared for emergencies. I don't have that in this class because most of the time when people are looking for a class to pay off debt, they've got some <laughs> or they're concerned that they might need to get some. If you're in a situation where your connections with others, be they, I mean, another, another good example is if you know that in your neighborhood, or in your circle of friends, you have a plumber, and you're not concerned about having to deal with plumbing issues because you've got that connection, That those that, are the types of connections that you really do want to try to make in a community, or in a family, or both. And so that's a really, really good way to create a more resilient um, existence, lifestyle for your household or your family, is to make those connections. And so if you're in that situation, that's terrific. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Sure. Are there any questions in Seward? Nope. You're good to go. 
Any other questions in Haynes? Nope. So I'm going to go ahead and put my information up again, especially for Seward, because they don't have the, um, the hard copy. So this is the information where um, I can be reached in Seward. Um, actually, you can also, of course, reach the Cooperative Extension District in Anchorage or on the Kenai. Both of those offices are great places to contact, um, and they have lots of information. And you can go to, which unfortunately we don't, I don't have on this slide here, so I need, to, I need to change that, the University of Alaska Fairbanks Cooperative Extension website, the main website, is www.uaf, as in Fairbanks, uaf.edu backslash CES. You can go to that site if you need me to say it again, just raise your hand. So if, if you've got that website, because there are lots of resources on that on all kinds of different topics, but if you go to that website, you can follow links to uh, family finances. And one of our agents up in Fairbanks, she does a lot of writing. She does, I think she does a weekly column in their newspaper, in the Fairbanks News Miner, on financial issues, household finance issues. So there's lots of different topics there from credit scores to how to take a vacation on a, on a budget, things like that. She, she talks about everything. So that's a good place to go for lots of information. Or you can always call, email me, whatever you'd like to do. I'm going to go ahead and put the presentation down so I can see you guys a little bit better. And if there are any final questions, if not, we can sign off. We have a final comment for you, Sarah. Yes. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. This was my first OWL experience, and it was hard for me to stay still because I know that when I move, it doesn't, you can't see it very well. But so thank you so much, and thank you for joining. I'm so pleased that we had folks from both Seward and Haynes.